what I wanted to know first of all is how you how you got started. Was it as a photojournalist? Did I have that right? Yes, yes. Um, I started. I was. Uh, what's the word? I I was very early into photography. I mean, I was I was walking around with a camera around my neck when I was eleven years old. So, and um, I I started at art school where I was studying photography and. Uh, I got a job almost immediately, and I, I left that school. And I worked. I was working. By, I was a working photojournalist by the time I was eighteen. And um, part of, part of one of the assignments I got was to do special photography, not unit photography, but you know, tw- twice a week for um, a, a company at Shepparton Studios outside London for British Lion Films. And at the same time, I'd been traveling and working by myself and I, fi- I was finding the the photojournalistic life was was very solitary and I just enjoyed being with the film crew so much and I thought well this is this life looks much better than than the still photography life you know dog eat dogs because it was so collaborative mm-hmm. and <clears throat> I used my uh, portfolio to get a special place at the Royal College of Art in London, a postgrad school, because I didn't have any exams. I'd, I'd left school and I was hopeless. But on the basis of my photography, they gave me a special entry to the school, to the photo- to the film school. Hmm. And there, I had this wild ambition that I wouldn't be a director, which is what everybody else wanted to be, but I would shoot their films and, and learn how to do that. So. I, I, I must have screwed up at least 25 of my fellow students' films because I knew nothing. And then, uh, and then I began to get an inkling of what it was about and then started a pretty long, hard road to, to get experience after I left school. Did you do do- documentary work at, at that time? Or? Oh, I did everything. I did industrial work. I did uh, little films for children's television. I mean, at that time in England and also in the United States. But at that time in England, you couldn't get into the film business. Um, there was no independent film business, and you couldn't get into the film business unless you were in the union, and you couldn't get into the union unless your dad was in the union. Mm-hmm. So there, there, there were just crumbs that would be thrown out to anybody who's stupid or <clears throat> desperate or just starving to to uh, take them and they were terrible jobs because they they were the only work that was available was non-union it was unsafe it was unpoliced and it was virtually unpaid and i just put myself out, out there that i would do anything and take anything and just shoot mm. and i began to get those kind of jobs and and uh, some of them were were, were very hairy uh but I, I was, I don't know, I was possessed. And so I did them. And I slowly began to get more legitimate work, very slowly. And then somehow uh, there, was, <laughs> there was a film animation company, a famous company called Hallison Bachelor. And the managing director took a, took a shine to me, saw how determined I was, out of film school, and he offered me a job inside his animation company, not as an animator, but to just read scripts for him and advise him about doing live-action films with this film company that was in Covent Garden. It was really just him trying to mentor me, because what was going on was that he was negotiating with the British Union to, to, to make an animated film which would employ, I think, 200 animators for two years hmm. under the union, not non-union. And as part of that agreement, the union agreed to take in everybody who was already employed inside the company, whoever they were, into the union. And that's how I got into the union, but not as a, film, a cinematographer or even a photographer, but as a, what was called a rostrum animator, rostrum animation cameraman, wow. which is a very esoteric, and, of course, it was nothing of the sort. It was just a way to get in the union. But once I was in, much as they tried, they couldn't find any legal way to get, get me out. And I began to, to work legitimately 
within the film industry. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, and began to get, you know. Yeah, and, v- and very early on, uh, you had an amazing opportunity to, to, to work on a, on a big project like Outland with, with Peter Himes. Um, yeah. So how, how, how do you get from where, from where you just told me you left off entering the union to, to a big job like that? Well, what happened is that I shot a lot of commercials in the meantime. Uh, I, I got in the union about the age of 26, and I, sh- I began to shoot commercials for people like uh, and with Tony Scott, mm. and uh, because we were at school together, and um, and then a lot of fellow students. So the idea, you see, that when I went to film school, I would just be a cameraman it was attractive to students who wanted to be directors, because at least we'd all have the same level of inexperience, and, and we could we could work. The, you know, it wouldn't be a threat to them. We we always we all knew that we knew basically next to nothing, and. Uh, and so it was a little group of us, and uh, so we, we we began working on each other's films. And it was a time of change in London, and it was a fashionable place for people to make their movies. It was cheaper for American productions, and um, and I went. I sort of segued from commercials with a, a director called Brian Gibson to his first mm-hmm. film, who a, a very young Dodie Fayed who later died with Princess Diana, was the, was the producer. And uh, we made a film, it was quite successful, called Breaking Glass, a punk rock musical, successful in, its, on its, in England. And uh, I came to the notice of Peter Hyams, who was looking for a cameraman. But what I didn't, in my naivety, understand was that he wasn't looking for me to shoot the film exactly. He was looking for me to just get him out of trouble when he didn't know what to do when he was shooting the film. I see. Okay. And and, uh, and he he wasn't dead straight to me about that. I, I believed I'd be shooting the film. He he, his intention was to stick me in the corner, and uh, just call me out to take the to take the blame if anything went wrong. But I liked him. I mean, he was a real character, and I think he liked me. And we sort of cooperated, and the film became so huge. There were seven stages with with uh, sets on them, and there, there, were, there was more than enough work for the two of us. And we just we split the work. I learned a lot from him. Perhaps he learned a bit from me, and uh, and it came out quite well. And it, it, it in the end, what could have been a sort of humiliating experience turned into into a uh, a learning experience for me, and mm-hmm. I didn't get fired, and that's pretty important when you're only on your second or third film. <laughs> that's that's always a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's it's not a, getting a, not getting not getting fired on your second picture is really a, <laughs> a, a very good thing. And, and it's a great credit to have to have on your resume, especially that early. Yeah. But, you know, and then you work with with your your classmate Tony Scott on The Hunger. And exactly. Yeah. When I think of The Hunger, and actually, if you double it up with Blade Runner, which I believe came out the same year from Ridley, I mean, you're, you're right. looking at two films that don't look like anything that had been made before. It, it almost feels like a new kind of uh, film noir in in a way. And I'm wondering what your yeah. visual inspirations were when you put that film together. Um. Well, what you've got to understand is we were experimenting with looks in commercials, which were in England were shot very much not by directors who wanted to, to make their careers in advertising, which is a fair enough thing to do, but the people I was working with, all of them, wanted to be film directors. We were talking people, Tony, of course, and Ridley, and Hugh Hudson, and Howard Gard, and Brian Gibson, and a whole host uh a whole host of tremendously talented, ambitious young directors, all in our twenties, and all wanting to make movies at some point. And so they they would get these jobs to shoot these commercials, but they didn't. They turn them into uh, mini films. And so we'd experiment with huge single source lights, and uh, we'd shoot on big stages with huge sets, and you know. It, it, it was a good training so that when we eventually scrabbled our way up to get a film, we actually knew vaguely where to put the light and 
how to shoot. And but we've been very experimental. There'd be like been four or five years of, of being. I mean, if you look at Ridley's uh, and Tony's commercial work, you if you dated it back, you would see very much the seeds of Blade Runner and The Hunger yeah. and, and other and Top Top Gun and things like that. And um, so when I did The Hunger with Tony, it was really an extension of the work that we'd already been doing, or, or that, you know, not necessarily together, but here and there. And um, so we talked about it, and then we were both devotees of Helmut Newton, who was at the height of his influence in, in Vogue in Paris and in London. And we looked at those photographs, and he said, well, let's, let's, let's copy this. This is good. And it was good because people really people outside the game, particularly in film, didn't know about Helmut Newton. And uh, so he was a good guy to copy. We could pretend to be original. And it, and, I, and uh, I told Helmut Newton that once, and he, he just laughed. He loved it, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and so that, that if there was a genesis, it was around the sort of lighting with no fill light, using smoke, using long lenses, um, being on the edge. It was, it, it was very brave work. Don't forget, there's nothing digital going on here. Mm-hmm. It, it, there was no rescue to be achieved. And we went further and further with the lighting and pushing it and pushing it until one day I shot Bertie a whole day and nothing came out whatsoever. But I, but, but I, I, I did, uh, I did, wait before I made that experiment until the film was almost over, you know, we had another day or two to shoot. And and uh, Tony was very kind to uh, to hide the dailies from the producer so no one ever really found out. <laughs> well, I was about to ask you if there, if there was ever a, when you're experimenting, if, if there's ever a danger of going too far where you where you can possibly veer away from the the, the emotional continuity of the story or 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 yeah but absolutely absolutely there is and you and that's what you must be doing it's like robert kappa said about war photography if your if your pictures aren't good enough then you're not close enough and if your film doesn't look good enough you're not going far enough you've hmm. got to push you've got to push every anybody can do ordinary work mm-hmm. and they do and lots of them but I, I, I mean, we we were pretty. Our lives were reasonably wild at that time, and the films were quite different, and the opportunities were different too. Yeah. Um, and well, film, film itself is a beautiful medium, and that's that's what we were shooting on. We didn't think of anything else. Well, I look at I look at your your resume, and, and one of the things that strikes me, first of all, you've you've worked with, you've collaborated with such terrific artists, but you, all of your films are so diverse. I mean, The Hunger couldn't be more different from The Prince of Tides or Batman Forever or, or at least The Weapon. Right. Uh, and I'm curious when you when you seek out inspiration, when you look at older older films or other other DPs right. or what what inspires you. To, to tell you the truth, the, the, the work that I enjoy most watching, the, the work that inspires me, the work that is part of my life, is often visually very, I wouldn't say conventional, but is, is very much a part of the narrative. Mm-hmm. Maybe I, <clears throat> I mean, as it happens, I've been studying films since, I was that high. I was just nuts about film, and I used to hang out in uh, a, a movie, a movie theater, film, art film theater called the Everyman in Hampstead in North London, near where I lived, where I lived. And I'd spend days of the week going to one French film after another. And to this day, my favorite films are black and white, and everyone's speaking in French, and nothing was made after 1952. But it's, it, it's just that just because you can sh- shoot in one star doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to shoot in another. And I think a sort of virtuosity in, uh, in a 
cinematographer is something to be applauded, not to say, oh, he doesn't have a style. He has many styles. And that's because there are many stories and many different ways of of looking at photography and imagery. So I, I admire the extraordinary uh, visual artists, you know, the shimmer and the, and the backlight and all that stuff. But I also admire the, the wonderful narrative work of, of uh, classic filmmaking. Right. And in a way, I admire it more than anything else because I think it's, for me, it's far more difficult Personally, I'm not saying for everybody, I'm saying for me, it's far more difficult to shoot a film that, in, say, involves 15 Nazis sitting around a table discussing the Holocaust than to shoot uh, Batman forever. Right. Right. But do, do you see that you particularly have your own distinctive style, or do you think of yourself as being kind of a chameleon to... to to accomplish whatever your your director that you're collaborating with wants for their particular project. I could take it as the highest compliment to be to be known as the chameleon, as cinematographers, yeah. to be able to disappear into each project. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a there's, I think there in a sense is a higher calling when shooting a movie beyond what the director wants. It's what the story needs. And that's not to say that the director isn't the boss. Of course he is. But many directors shoot infrequently or come into the, uh, or come into the business as uh, great writers and great directors of actors, but in, in expert with the camera or with the visual side of life. And film being so collaborative, it's part of my job and part of the designer's job to flesh out the narrative, flesh out the performance with what we are expert at and what is our passion. Mm -hmm. you, you know, uh, people sometimes say to me, don't you want to direct? And I've got to say... Yes, in theory, if if I was talented in that direction, where, where my natural where my natural talents lie, I believe is imagery and and, the, and the, the pictures and the way I feel and see the camera moving and the light and the color and mm -hmm. and that's that's where I'm happiest and when I can collaborate with a director who's my friend and we're fellow artists and we're, and we're designers and. We're all trying to work on the same film and make it as good as we possibly can, come hell or high water. There's, no, there's nothing, frankly, much more exciting than that. Right. Well, you know, and I, I love how you say that it, it's all in, in service of the story. I mean, everyone on a film set is, an, in a sense, an assistant storyteller. But it, yes. when, you, when, you look at, when you look at your projects, when you look at a story – I would think that you would have to be emotionally invested in that story to, to do it justice. Has there ever been an occasion where you've had difficulty actually becoming invested or feeling passionate about a particular story? Yeah, absolutely. And they, and they usually are the, are the weakest films I've worked on. Hmm. But, but sometimes needs must, you know. Some, sometimes uh, you've got to pay. Yeah. You've got to pay the bills. And... Uh, uh, and there's, there's, there's no, there's not, I'm not for one second ashamed of uh, doing a job uh, as well as I possibly can, but I can't hide the fact that I perhaps feel that it's really uh, high-end nonsense. And that makes it more difficult to do your best work. Mm-hmm. And generally speaking, in, in in the last ten years or so, I've uh, I've not done it. There's two two reasons two two reasons not to do a film. You don't like the script, or, and you and you hear that the director is a, a monster, mm -hmm. and th that's uh, that's uh, that's reason enough not to do it because no amount of fame 
and <laughs> no amount of money could put up for the hell that working with someone who you dislike, who is, say, sadistic or punitive or insane, nothing can make up for that. And it, it, it's, it's hard enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, because we left off of the hunger, and I, I just want to ask you about just a couple of titles on your resume, mm-hmm. and, and, and then I'll let you go. I, I thank you so much for sure. giving me time today. But, you know, the, one of one of the films that you've worked on, which has earned a degree of infamy, is The Cotton Club. Um, oh, yes. Did, did, the, did the production feel more harmonious than we were led to believe, or, or, or did it feel chaotic? Well, I sort of like chaos. Mm-hmm. As long as it's, as long as it's, I don't like chaos if it's cruel. I don't like chaos if it's uh, destructive and dangerous. But what Francis was trying to do, and I, I still see Francis, and uh, I still love him dearly. What Francis was trying to do was to protect the production from all kinds of problems. And you, you, there, there can be inner productions, people who are really only in it for the money or really only in it to do someone else in, in which the production itself is just a, a weapon to be used against perceived enemies. Mm. And the director, if faced with these problems, has got to fight like nothing on earth and put people around him who can be his his fellow soldiers to just to preserve what he wants to do and that is in, in a nutshell I love shooting Cotton Club and I love being in uh, the company of Francis Coppola of course he's one of the great geniuses of film and I learned so much from him and, and, he, and, uh, and, and I would think that I, I mean I spoke with uh Michael Ballhouse uh, a couple of days yes. ago, and he shot Dracula for Coppola. Yes, and uh, he strikes me as a director that allows you the freedom to explore and experiment and push it to to the limit. Oh, ab- absolutely! He, he he would say outright, "Surprise me." Yeah. Or one of his favorite favorite phrases. Well, well uh, what what would you like to do, Francis? Do the right thing. <laughs> well, it's quite a challenge. It's quite a challenge, uh, but uh, he's a pretty wonderful guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so when when you when you start on a project, I mean, where do you like to begin? Because I heard in, in Angels in America, you you started very early in the in the pre production. Yes. When, when do you like to come I, on board? I, I like to come on. As soon as soon as possible, I'll work. I'll I'll drop my rate in half or less, so that I'm involved early, early on. Because I need to. I need to be involved with the production designer. I need to be involved with the location manager. I need to be involved intimately with the writer and the director to really see not only what we have but what we could achieve. Mm-hmm. And um, that sort of preparation makes you very light on your feet when you're actually shooting. And it's cheap because in prep, you don't have 200 people. Maybe you have 20. And uh, it is, it's the best form of insurance that any producer, any production manager can have is to have substantial, continuous prep so that you you have – You've got your, yourself ready. Some people can say, oh, you're so lucky, but luck comes from preparation. And I like to visit the locations in every light. I like to make sure I know what the light may be in good weather and bad, bad weather. And I like to be able to make my plans for either event mm-hmm. so, so that you can really, really have a handle on what's up. Now, this is, this is in an ideal world. Things go wrong, uh, and you, you've got to, you've got to be adaptable. You've got to be able to function when you're scared or when there's chaos. But you've got to be 
you've got to be aware that if you don't prep, you're just making life difficult, not only for yourself, but for everybody who's trying to do and trying to help you. If I've worked with a production designer for two months, I know how the sets will be, and I've and he's already accommodated for where I need the crane to go or all, all the lighting rigs. And I know what his problems are. And the director can be confident that after he's rehearsed with his actors and he turns to me and says, uh, when will you be ready? I can say, I'll be ready uh, in uh, an hour and a half, sir. And the actors will go off, finish their wardrobe and makeup, and they come on and we can shoot that scene and it can be just perfect in the first take, but that comes from preparation. Mm-hmm. Well, do you do you also find that? Uh, I mean, certainly preparation is 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 of paramount importance, but but to also be kind of flexible on your on your feet to take advantage of of happy accidents. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's kind of a balance. That, that's that's the whole point. If you're prepared, you can you're you're ready to take. Hmm. To, to to go with anything that can happen because you know the lay of the land. It's a sort of military point of view that you, you're going in, in, into a fight, into a battle, but you know where the hills are and you know where the water is and you know the, when what time of day the wind changes and you know when it gets dark and you know when it gets light and what and and the temperature of everything and you know the performances too because you've been there at the rehearsals and you can see right. The, the sort of behavior of some actors. Some actors go very much into themselves in this, and they, you must allow them to be concentrated and in character, and others want a more casual relationship. And all those things, you come dead into it's, You come dead into, into a production, you know none of the above, and uh, you can get into big trouble and expensive trouble. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I'm looking over your films. You, you've made the biggest action films from, from Lethal Weapon, the Lethal Weapon films to the, the most intimate character movies, uh, including Closer, which is a yes. movie that I absolutely adore. It means a lot to me. When, which brings up the idea of your relationship with, with actors. I mean, obviously, the, the main major conduit on the film set to the actor is the director, but w- what is your level of communication with the actor generally? Well, I'm observing them with great attention, where they move, what, how their performance is going, how I, how I can possibly help them to do what is very intimate and difficult. Sometimes I fail, but generally speaking, I'm very admiring of their work, and I want, I want to really help them so that what they're trying to achieve actually happens on film. Mm-hmm. So if if at some point we've got a we've got a moving shot that's gonna end up in a in a close up, I need I need to help them so that they can find the mark. And I can talk about these necessities so that, you know, they hit the right light and so, look, nobody can can have overall experience of everything. We've all going to be inexperienced in some area or the other. And I've become experienced in in learning how to light women. Mm-hmm. And so if I can, and so, the, but to to get the best light, they need to understand where they need to look and where they need to place their body. And so I I, I will sort of very with great discretion. Talk, talk with an actress or an actor, for that matter, and and so that they look their best for that particular character in a screenplay. And so I totally, I will, I'm, I'm not trying to in any way preempt what the director is doing. That's a different relationship. I'm talking about their presence in in the set and in the light. Absolutely. And sometimes you can. You, sometimes you can. Uh, Pussyfoot about it, and uh, I remember I was, I, was, I was muttering in Mark Rydell's ear that the way Bette Midler was looking in a, in a scene, and Bette was watching us, and he screams across the set, I know, I know, more chins than the Peking phone book. 
which is exactly what I've been saying. I'm saying she has to look up at this point, Mark, because it's not looking great. And, and so she broke the ice there. <laughs> you know, but, um, but a lot of a lot of but, great actors are, I, I would imagine, they are aware of their strengths. they and they're aware of of how to play to camera. I mean, there's there's a technician aspect of it that I'm sure that a lot of yeah. them have. Yes, there is, and uh, it doesn't hurt. But there are also a lot of actors who don't want to know about that. Mm-hmm. Well, and 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 directors. There are directors, famous directors, who who don't want rehearsal ever. And um, and a lot of actors who don't want to know. They just want to be in the emotion in the moment. Well, it it, it doesn't necessarily make for a, a, a better looking performance. It makes maybe a good performance, but you do, do need some cooperation between between the uh, the movement, the the acting, and the uh, and the camera. Yeah. Before I let you go, I want to ask you about one question about technology. Um, I mean, we're, yeah. we've kind of reached a precipice here where you know film is is you know, dwindling, the use of film and 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 digital is taking over. What, right. what do, you, do you think it holds exciting possibilities, or are you weary of this? Oh, complete. I'm, oh, well, I'm weary of the whole discussion because I don't think it's relevant <laughs> to any change in in what good films are about, which is story and the support of wardrobe and makeup and hair and cinematography and design and location and music and all the elements that make up a great film are exactly the same elements when you're shooting on digital or when you're shooting on film. They're they're different. There's an awful word, workflow, but there's always been workflows and there are different problems, but there have always been problems for Really, the biggest problem of all is how on earth do we make this story great? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, and the, whether that, that never changes. Yeah, that, that never changes. But that's the big problem. That's the real problem. Everything else is is uh, secondary to that problem. I I agree with you. I mean, it, it does. I I think there there are, there are purists out there. Uh, latching on to the idea of, I mean, they're 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 latching on to film, but uh, in the end, it's never necessarily been about the technology. Technology has been the tool to allow you to tell the story, but the story Look, has always te- been. Te- yes, the story is always the thing. Of course, technology uh, can change the way you the way you tell the story. Mm-hmm. But if, uh, whether whether it's the steady cam, whether it's uh, whether it's the fact that you can now shoot at night without lighting up the neighborhood, uh, all, all, all sorts of things can help you tell the story. And, and because they are available tools, they can also make it possible to shoot different kinds of stories. But the story's the thing. Right. And, uh, and when you forget that and get involved with this, that, and the other, which are not relevant to the narrative, you can get lost in it, and, and people do. Mm-hmm. And all power, all power to the directors and the DPs who only want to shoot on film, and I admire them and their courage and whatever, but I, uh, personally, I love film, and I love photography, but I haven't shot a, a film frame in my, in my other life as a photographer in 10 years. Wow. And I haven't shot yet um, a movie on anything but film, but I intend my next film to be a, a sh- shot digitally, and I can't wait. Mm. 